take it, jumps it well. Altior wins the Clarence House, wins again. Shishkin, pinpoint accurate. None more impressive than Shishkin. But Shishkin is motoring down the outside. Shishkin closing the gap with every stride. And Shishkin delivers. Nico, we're trying to get into the mind of one or two jockeys. And when I spoke to Paddy Brennan, it was always going to be very easy, I felt. And I asked a few of his colleagues what he thought, and I kind of knew what they were going to say. With you, I had no idea. You're, you're almost a mystery figure. Is that a question? That is a question. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, but you are, aren't you? Like, you go on the internet, you Google Nico de Boinville, you find out you're born in 1989, mm. which will surprise a lot of people, I hazard a guess, watching this. Um, Why is that? Because you think I'm older? I think people would think I look you older. might be a bit older than that, yeah. Because of my hair? Yeah, and there's a maturity <laughs> about you as well. You're not, you're not someone I think that the people would imagine is, is off to a London nightclub on a Saturday night or, or a Friday. I know you're a family man and everything, but yeah. do you see what I'm saying? Like, you, you bring maturity to the table, I feel. Yeah, I mean... I certainly had my fair share of having a good time when I was younger, um, but that's certainly off the table now. Well, it might be on the table in a minute. Right. But um, as I say, with Paddy, I knew what they were going to say. Yeah. Um, with you, I didn't. Um, here's a flavour of what one person said, and it became a theme of all the people I spoke to. He's the sort of fella that, you know, if you're in like World War II, or I mean, if you're ever in World War Three, he'd be... Yeah, he'd be just the man you'd want to be in charge of your battalion or platoon or whatever. He's just very, very calm. You, you know, and that, that's, that's where he's at his strongest. Whether he's riding Shishkin or Ram Plumpton, you really wouldn't know the difference. He's just, he's the calmest bloke I've ever come across. That he's not like horizontal and playing it cool. He's just very, very calm. And everyone said that. Everyone said that. Is that... For me, that's something that's come from a childhood somewhere along the line. You're not born with that. You create that. Have you ever been, have you always been this sort of super cool, calm, collected character? Um, I guess it's very different when you're from being on a horse to not on a horse. Um, but I guess when I, when I am on, in a competitive environment on a horse, then I have always seemed to have that, I think. Because most people, what I've learned in life as I got older is most people have triggers. Hmm. There are things that set them off. Mm -hmm. What everyone I spoke to about you said that you don't have those things. Is, is, there, is there anything that gets you really angry other than being jocked off a horse or something like that? But I mean, <laughs> is, uh, secretly, but is, is, is there, a, I mean, road rage, is, is there anything that, or are you one of these people who can just see the good side of most things? No, I'm, I'm certainly a, a very flawed character. I suppose, if I go into it in depth. Um, but I've learned as I got older, you know, to control it. And of course I have my angry moments. We all experience a bit of road rage, but it's learning how to let those things go and uh, accept the situation for what it is. I mean, you've opened yourself up there to the obvious follow-up question. Mm. Um, if someone says I'm a flawed character, mm. that immediately everyone's thinking, well, hold on, what, what, what's mm. on there? To, to do what we do, I don't think you can be a completely balanced individual. Um, I think to get to any, to get to the top of any sport, I believe that there has to be a few kinks here and there. But in some ways you came into this game not thinking you would get to the top. That's very true. I, it was just a, I came in thinking, let's give it a go and see where we, and I turned up here in, Seven Barrows in 2009 as just a, a stable lad and it was all about you know seeing where I could go with it you know and if I had if I rode a few winners then so be it and then you know I might go training or we'll soon find out but uh, it was just a steady progression. So we've got the Iceman I'm sat next to the Iceman if, if this was Top Gun you'd be you'd be ice. Um, Definitely not that cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, so let's go back because mm. you are whether you like it or not, Nikolai Chastel de Boinville. Mm -hmm. There's French heritage in there. Mm -hmm. When did the de Boinvilles decide, you know, was it guillotine time that you decided that, that 
maybe it might not be quite so good in France. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, it was, yeah. So the family moves here. Mm -hmm. what, what is a young de Boinville intending to do with his life? Well, I don't Have know. You, I, I had you go a boarding school. Yeah, clearly. I had a I had a privileged upbringing. There's no, you know, I can't deny that. Um, but I was always mad keen on the ponies, and you know that sort of kept me out of trouble. The little itch here, yep. gives something away. If I I've watched enough detective shows, right? What does that mean? Well, it probably means you're not totally comfortable talking about your upbringing. No, it's fine. It's just yeah. you know I don't mind talking about it. I went to a um, secondary school that enabled me to do my writing at the same time which was important um, for me. Dad's working in the city? Dad was in, yeah, he was an insurance broker right. in the city. Sadly, mum, mum no longer with us. And I know yeah. her passing yeah. was something that was really sad in, in, in your life. But Yeah, it came at a difficult time. Um, and it's never easy to, you know, for your mother to die. But, you know, we all have to deal with it at some stage, I'd say. So you, you end up at university. What, what, what were you due to study at university. I say due because well, you weren't there very long. No, I wasn't there for very long. I did about six weeks. Um, I did history and politics. Okay. So which, which looking back on it, you know, I, I would have really enjoyed the degree and I would have, you know, even now I look at it and I'm still really interested in those subjects. Um, there was every chance you could have been studying your own family. The, the De Boinvilles sound as though they well, must have been in there somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm still very interested in history and how we all came to be here and um, politics to a degree as well. Well, hence why David Bass, no doubt, is one of your 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 best friends in the way. Yeah. But coming back, so you're, you're at university, and, and we kind of see the less calm, probably, side of you here, because you leave, you just mm. walk out. Mm. That's, not, that's not ice, that's not calmness, that's someone who's got a drive in them. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did sort of eight months, no, seven months with um, Richard Gibson in France, in Chantilly. After and, university or before? No, before. Right. On my gap, yeah. Right. And... Uh, he sort of instilled in me, that, you know, that ambition was okay to have and you can have the drive and it's all okay. And I could be good enough to go and do whatever I wanted to do in the industry. And so I, I went to university probably not really wanting to be there and more just to please my parents rather than anything else. But horses have been around all your life? Ponies, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Or non-stop. Mm. And how did you get... In, was that just a family thing that, that you were living a sort of rurally life? Yeah, we, we lived on a farm I and mean, we weren't in the back end of nowhere we're just you know in between um, Newbury and Basingstoke and you know I did a bit of hunting and things like that and my um my grandfather's was a, a master of the hunt and you know hunting was a big thing through my mother's side of the family um and then it just sort of escalated the the odd bit I can find on you out there suggests that you weren't a bad pony or show jumper even you won competitions and stuff I did a lot of uh, showing which isn't it's not jumping, but it's, you know, going around a ring looking pretty. Um, you won that? Oh, we, I had a bit of success, you know, right. but it was, it, was, it was competition at an early age. You, know, you didn't doing... have a bit of success. You, you, you won competitions and things like that. I went to, uh, you know, shows like Horse of the Year show, the Royal International and, you know, good shows. And um, I was taught by a brilliant couple called Richard and Marjorie Ramsey. And um, they gave me a certain amount of discipline and stability and taught me about how to improve myself. Talk to me through the torture of being at university then, because if someone goes to university, they leave after six weeks, mm. that's torture. They've, they've, they've gone through something they've really disliked. Yeah. Talk to me about that well, feeling. I, was, I, was up, I went to, um, up to Newcastle and it was torture just driving up there. I didn't want to go there. So I ended up, I don't know, you go out, enjoy Freshers Week, um, have a good drink and yeah, eventually it's, it's not for you. Um, lectures were just a nightmare. Nine o'clock lectures just didn't happen for me. Um, I went and rode out a few times for Howard Johnson. Um, I was bitterly cold up there. Um, yeah, it just wasn't for me. I think it was it was six weeks of not wanting to be there, and eventually you just say, right, that is it. Finally, I'm done. Let's go and move on to something else. And luckily, my parents were both supportive of that. They're a bit disappointed that I didn't make it to Christmas, but. Um, it just wasn't meant to be. And so what happens next? I get home, I go to work for my aunt um, and uncle, Patrick and Philippa Chamings, who coincidentally live right next door to my parents. And I work there for until the summer, until I decide to go to 
seven bars. And I remember those days because obviously I've, I've been in this game now long enough to, mm. to remember when Sprinter Sacra was, was in the yard. And I remember you were kind of the go-to man we went to for quotes on Sprinter. Like, if you wanted a yeah. quote on Sprinter Sacra, you didn't go to Nicky Anderson. You went to Nico de Boinville. <laughs> like, you were the spokesman almost for Sprinter Sacra. I was very fortunate. One day, you know, I hadn't been here that long and I suddenly, his name was against my name and then onwards we go. But at that stage, you wanted to be a jockey yeah? or you wanted to be... Uh, a, a sort of stable worker. I, I wanted to be a jockey, but you know, it's it doesn't just happen. And for someone like me, you know, I turned up at Seven Barriers with, I'd ridden in a couple of flat races in France. I'd ridden in a couple of point to points. I was very green and very sort of, didn't really have a clue what I was doing. Um, so it took a lot of working out. You know, I had to go back home and try and figure out where I'm going wrong and what was going on. I only had one ride in my first season when I was here. Um, and it didn't go very well. You get some success fairly early on. Um, Petit Robin is a big race mm. winner for you in 2012. Then, then it goes quiet for a couple of years, really. No big races or something. Then Whisper comes along, and then you you hit Conagree. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you got the ride on Conagree. How, how did that come about? The Bradstocks were looking for someone to claim off um, Carruthers on Boxing Day, and Dave Roberts, my agent, put me up there, and I went up to go and see them. And we got on really well, and the horse was brilliant to ride. You know, he's so well schooled, and um, they just wanted to claim off him for that day. And I went and won on him at Foss Lass and in bottomless ground when no one was really watching. And from then on, you know, I, you know, I went and rode him again in the West Welsh National when that was at uh, Foss Lass, and it just spiralled from there. How are you feeling at this stage? Because you've gone from this, you've ditched uni, mm. you've gone to Henderson's. You're kind of thinking, I might make a jockey. And suddenly you're about to ride the winner of the Gold Cup. And, you know, having been the man who looks after Sprinter Sacra, I mean, it's, mm. it's a meteoric rise, really. It might have seemed like a long time for you, but it, in general terms, to get on a horse like that mm. so soon and to be a Gold Cup winning jockey, yeah. which, you know, Peter Scudamore was never a Gold Cup winning jockey. It, it seemed like forever at the time to get to that stage. Um... You know, I was here. Even for the calmest man in racing. Yeah, I was getting agitated. You know, I I wanted to, if things didn't start happening soon, then that would have been me gone. You know, I always had, I always because I enjoyed my time in France so much. You know, I always thought, oh, maybe I'll go back there and see what I can do there. But um, so this is the interesting side of it for me. This is this is the bit of the Boyne Bill that I'm trying to get to mm. because all your rivals think you're ice cool and calm. Mm. But in you somewhere is this incredible driving ambition, mm. clearly. Mm. Like you ditch university because you think you could, you're, mm. you're better off doing something somewhere else. There's a, there's a place for you to be mm. yeah. to fulfill whatever you need fulfilled. So, so in actual fact, before Putty Robin won the listed race at, um, on Tingle Creek Day, the week before, um, which would have been the Hennessy weekend at Newbury, I actually went to the boss and handed in my notice and said, I'm out of here, I'm done. And anyway, the next day I was declared on a horse called Cucumber Run at Newbury, which came second in the, I think it was a per temps qualifier or something. And um, it just went from there. But I was, I was prepared to, you know, give it all up and go because I felt, you know, I had to, sometimes you have to make your own luck sometimes. If you had though, there might have eventually been a feeling, hold on, I'm, I, I, I quit quite quickly but from my point of view i've been here since i was 19 i was then 20 20 22 um and i just yeah i guess it was a youthful impatience i'd say or someone who believes in their ability and isn't they feel getting the chances their ability deserves and that's not being big-headed that's what we all have to believe no i i guess it was just let's see what happens but i was prepared to to leave here, yeah. And luckily the boss said, no, you don't. So you win the Gold Cup on Conagree. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like on your journey as a, as a person? I was very glad that I rode a winner at Cheltenham the year before, um, because then you could just sort of take it all in and enjoy it for what it was. Um, but it was, a, 
you know, on, on the lead up to, to Cheltenham as well, I'd lost the ride on Coney Creek. Uh, Dickie took over in the Denman Chase because I was banned that day. And I thought, oh, God, that's my chance in the Gold Cup <laughs> gone. But, um, you know, the Brasslocks are such loyal people. You know, they persuaded the owners that I could still do it. And I was, I'd just lost my claim as well. At that stage of your riding, what, what do you feel your assets were as a rider? Oh, I don't know. I was just, I was just enjoying the ride at the time. But was it, was it, are you someone who would work out races from a mathematical point of view, placement? Are you someone who thought, I can get horses to jump, they would just jump for me? Like, at the moment, for instance, people are saying, Charlie Deutsch. Yeah. Fences, he's a magician. Everyone has their niche that, or rightly or wrongly, incidentally, mm. but everyone says, was there something that you thought when you got on a certain horse, like, oh, this, this is my, this is what I want to do. Two mile chasers, three mm. mile chasers, mm. two mile hurdlers. Was there one of those categories that you thought, that's me? Not so much. I just enjoyed riding good horses. And the competition in, side in, or in, riding the horse? I, I loved riding good horses in good races. You know, that's, that's where I got a real kick from and, and I still do. I ask you that just because you, you, I'm sure, occasionally hear and read things. I hear and read things. Some people say, De Boinville, not good on a hard puller. So all those things are kind of things that people get in their mind. I'm trying to, trying to work out what, what you thought you were really good at, like whether it's presenting a horse at a fence or something like that. I, 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 I guess I never looked in. I don't look into it in that much depth. Do you now? No. No, I just, you know, I don't even, even now I don't really overanalyze replays or anything. Um, but the other day you won on Chantry House. Yeah. Yeah, at Cheltenham. Yeah. Um, a lot of people would say that was a mixture. Of, I actually described it as a mixture of Paul Carberry and A.P. McCoy. Like there was genius in it in so many different ways. See, I really wouldn't. I would. But you wouldn't just, look at it. You'd no, just say, I'm giving those, it a right. Those names you've just mentioned are absolute, just... They're the geniuses of our sport, aren't they? I mean, Paul Carberry, I'll never forget that uh, ride he gave Belvano in the Grand Annual. And that was, that's a genius bit of riding. Whereas I was just trying to get my horse to run to the best of his ability. And yeah, I'm talking to a man who I think now is 31 grade ones. Yeah. 31 grade ones, more than any other jockey currently riding? I don't know, it's just... Well, what do you think? No, no. Um, is there another jockey who's run more than 31 grade ones? Oh, I don't know, in the, well, in the well, UK. There isn't, is there? There isn't, not right. in the UK. There might be in Ireland, but not in the well, UK. Definitely in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, but not here. So you're being modest because you know that there isn't. I've been told that. I don't what? know for sure. I don't go and look up these stats. Okay, you know, I'm not well, really I'm, interested. There right? isn't, yeah. yeah. You're Nicky Anderson's stable rider. Mm. It's like to think of other people as brilliant and you not as brilliant seems crazy to me. Yeah, but they were in that sort of golden era of jockeys where it's just, you know, I don't forget, I, when they were at their very peak, I was still, you know, a teenager coming up and, you know, I used to love watching them. Let's just mention a few of the champions. You immediately after Conery, you had Altior, that supreme, Altior, Min, Bouverdeur, probably the best race, Some race yeah. you've almost ever ridden in, mm. you could argue. Yeah, I mean, you go back, I always say everything comes out in the washing eventually. But further down the line, you look back on that race now and you think, wow, I mean, some of the horses in that race was just phenomenal. What a race that was. Um, just going through all the names that have come out of that race, all the way down to sort of eighth or ninth place, they've all come out and won races at the top level. And going into that race, it was always, always sort of billed as a, as a match race between Altior and Min. And it was a, it was a great sort of line up and uh, build up to that. And, you know, everyone loves the first race at the festival because of the roar and Everyone's sort of anticipating it and yeah, it was a fantastic day. And to get on Sprinter Sacra, having been in his box and looked after him so much and watched other people ride him and then, then to get on him and win big races on him, that, that must have been something that, that could almost be the highlight of, I imagine, of your career or a moment you'll never forget. I think that the key moment with Sprinter Sacra was, I, I was really, really involved with him you know, when Barry was riding him, you know, I, I rode Sprinter, Jerry rode Simon Sig, Jim and we Roy. always, yeah, and we always rode them together, you know, we worked them together, um, and we had to be very careful doing that. But I guess the, the key moment for, for me with, with Sprinter was that slower chase where he just seemed to light up again um, and show some semblance of his old self. And the, the reception we got from the Cheltenham crowd that day was just, it was a very special day. And Shishkin, let's 
go back to the Clarence House the other day and just ride the race with you. You start on the inside of David Bass. Bass jumps right, you jump left. Then you're out on the outside of your good mate, but also a man you know is going to go crazy at some point during the race. You know he's going to have a moment where he's going to do something. Mm. I, I, I suppose I wanted to line up because I wanted to get a good start and no one wants to give anything away at the start. And then Bassie's jumped across me at the first and I'm thinking, right, OK, let's just keep him in there and see if I can keep tabs on Paul. And then I knew at some stage Bassie would want to go forward and try and, you know, keep the pace true. Um, and then it was just a case of keeping tabs on the pair of them and trying not to get knocked over and just keep it as fluent and as fluid as I could. So you've gone out the Iceman. You've started, you've had to change your plan slightly. Then you do that peck. And Shishkin moving up on the outside now. And he pecked quite badly there, did Shishkin. But you're the Iceman. The mm. next fence, it's as if it never happened. Last fence on the far side. I better jump there by Shishkin. How do you... I mean, is your heart not in your, in your mouth at that moment? Or does it happen so quickly as a rider that you actually almost don't notice it's happened? Well, it was almost like Paul injected a bit of pace going down that hill. You know, his, his jumping was so fluent and he could just do that. And he knew that if I was going to get into any sort of trouble, it could have been down the hill. Um, and if I'm honest, it happens so fast that the next thing, you're at the next fence and away you go. It's, it's, it's so rapid that it may look a big moment to you, but to me it's, oh, we're back going again and off you go. One more fence to go here. Energomen on the inside. Shishkin, though, is trying hard to rein him back. One good jump from either of them. Energomen, the leader, but Shishkin is motoring down the outside now. Energomen by two lengths. Shishkin closing the gap with every stride. Energomen and Shishkin, this is what we wanted. And Shishkin delivers and beats Energomen. He quickened up in brilliant style to win it. And the last fence yeah. is also crucial. A lot of people might have gone crazy at the last fence. Yeah. One or two other riders who've analysed the race have said they would have just gone for it. You yeah. are quite happy just to take it quite chilled. Like, let's just get over and then hurtle up the running. Last fence at Ascot is, is quite close up the running. But about, about the half furlong going into that last fence, I thought that Shishkin was, you know, coming alive underneath me a bit. And I definitely could see that we were pegging back. Shishkin's also very quick when he's in tight and he's very quick away, and there was no stride there. Obviously, I would have loved to have met it on a perfect stride and away you go, but there was no stride there, so in and pop, and you, you still keep the revs up, and you're still going forward, and he actually landed running, and um, that was that. When you're a rider, because, again, it's so different when you're analysing or trying to analyse races, but I was watching and thinking, well, there, there is no horse in the world that can cruise round against Shishkin. Do you think like that on the way around? Like, OK, this guy's cruising in front of me, but there's no horse that can beat Shishkin just by cruising. Like, at, the, at some point, that horse has to come off the bridle. I guess what Shishkin shows me at home and what he shows me on the track is like... Chalk and cheese. Yeah, two different horses. Um, Nothing at home, no? Absolutely, no. He's so laid back and doesn't care what you do on top of him. He's just in his own world. And, but on the track, he just seems to come alive and you... You know, you can trust him implicitly. The, the comparisons with Altier are obvious because he races pretty much. I mean, there was a comparison yeah. that he travelled like Sprinter yeah. and he finishes like Altior, but he doesn't really travel like like Sprinter. He really just races like Altior now. Mm. We had this conversation with Altior. If he was a normal horse, you'd be running him over two and a half, wouldn't you already? If he was a normal horse, a handicapper. I mean, you possibly think of it. Um, well, you wouldn't. You'd be doing it. But in, in those top two mile races, you really have to stay as well. And that Cheltenham two miles, that it rides like two and a half. So coming up to Cheltenham, you've got two massive guns. You'll have great rides, but Constitution Hill and Shishkin. Yeah. I mean, Constitution Hill, that Supreme looks like it is the Altior, Min, Bouverdere Supreme all over again, isn't it? The first three could go on to do great things in the future. Exactly. It looks fantastic and it looks really strong in depth. And yeah, it, it's going to be a great race again. Constitution Hill looks like a different horse to Shishkin. Like... He looks like he'd be quite good at home as well. Is that the case or is he no good here either? Oh, he's very good at home. Right. He's very good. Um, Always felt like a machine, yeah? Yeah. Well, day to day, no, but you put him up size and he's, again, he seems to come alive. And as good as you've 
ridden as a novice hurdler. I know you've won Cheltenham races, so it's a bit unfair to say that before he's won a Cheltenham race. But at this stage of his career, before he's gone to Cheltenham, as exciting a horse as you've sat on? Certainly. I mean, he's felt fantastic. And again, all the form is stacking up again. And Shishkin, the rematch. There are pros and cons why both Inergamine and Shishkin and indeed Shaq and Boursois, who shouldn't be ignored, could be better at Cheltenham. But all in all, that turbo charge up the hill. Again, I don't like to overanalyze stuff. Um, well, this is your chance. Well, I'm not going to. Just go there and enjoy it. Well, we started with Tom Scudamore yeah. telling us what he thought about you. Do you want to know what Sam Tristan Davis said? Go on. It's quite depressing when you read this, actually. All round <laughs> great bloke. Look at this. Intelligent, kind, understanding and well measured. Do you know why that is? What because have you done sometime, for him? Well, sometimes I have to give Nigel a lift home. You see? Right. So I'm chauffeur So he's got well. ulterior so motives. Like the Twist and Davis chauffeur as well. Okay. What about, though, let's just bring this back to some sort of reality. David right. Bass. Yeah. Okay. His initial comment, which he obviously felt slightly guilty about because then he added things. Thank he God. initially just said tight and loves to gossip. Are you a gossiper? No. Who do um, you gossip about then? Bass says you love to gossip. No. So, so he's known me since I was, well, since I was 19, he would have been 20. Um, and we had a good bit of fun back then. Um, I'd be a very different personality. So you're, so you're saying you're not a gossiper, even though he says you are? No. OK, that's fine. He, he added after that, but a very good friend. And then I, I asked about the tight thing, because I wasn't quite sure what he meant there. Mm. So I said, as in Carl Llewellyn, like Carl Llewellyn, famous for being fairly stingy with, with cash, etc. And he said, maybe not. He said tight in lots of different ways. But then he said, and this was interesting, he said he's a brilliant jockey, and he did use a different word to what I'm going to use here. He said, when he can be bothered to give them a ride. <laughs> and on that bombshell, we'll leave it at that. We'll definitely leave it at that, yeah. Nikolai Chastel de Bonville, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Very good. Thank you very much. You like that? Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. I love that.